like to call to order the May 17, 2016 regular meeting of the Bowling Green Board of Commissioners. I invite you to stand if you choose as Commissioner Hill introduces uh, the invocation and the pledge. Tonight, we're very fortunate to have with us Mrs. Martha Christian. She is worship leader at the Broadway Melrose campus, and she's going to lead the prayer, but if you ever have the chance to come hear her sing, she has a voice like an angel. So, Martha. It is an honor to be here. Uh, let us pray. Father God, almighty maker of heaven and earth, God, we thank you for this moment to be here in this place together, knowing that you have strategically put every single person here for your purpose, a purpose that is greater than ourselves. God, we pray tonight for a reminder of why we are here. God, we pray for your spirit of unity to fall in this place. God, we pray for a bigger awareness of things that can happen and ripple out of our own town. God, we pray for eyes to see the people that are unseen in our town. God, we pray for a heart for the people that have voices smaller than our own. God, we pray that you would revive in us a desire to love and lead and serve and care for the people in our care. God, we thank you for this time. We pray for a spirit of love and unity and peace in this place. God, that we would do in this place greater things than we could ever dream of because of you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Also, we have with us tonight a fourth grader from McNeil Elementary, Mr. Aaron Burgett, and he is accompanied by his mother tonight, Jennifer, and his sister, Amber Lynn, and his father is busy working at the Holiday Inn University Plaza. So, Aaron, thank you. Pledge the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good job. Thank you. That's the McNeil Admirals, right? Go Admirals. Please call the roll. Commissioner Williams. Here. Commissioner Denning? Here. Commissioner Hill? Here. Commissioner Perrigan? Here. Mayor Wilkerson? Here. Do we have any awards or recognitions tonight, I, I sir? I have none. Any from the commission? Do you have any comments to advise Good. us? Mayor, uh, there'll be a need for an executive session. Uh, Katie will read the reason. Pursuant to KRS 621810C for discussions of proposed or pending litigation against or on behalf of the city. So move. Second. Motion by Hill, second by Perrigan. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Hill? Yes. Perrigan? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Any other comments, sir? None other. All right. Approval of the minutes for the May 3rd, 2016 meeting. So move. Second. Motion by Hill, second by Williams. Any comments or corrections? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Hill? Yes. Perrigan? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. We provide a time at our regular meetings for people to make comments on items that are not on the regular agenda. I want to invite people to do that right now. Mr. Howard, I think you're first up tonight. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I come tonight as uh, the president of Cedar Ridge Area Neighborhood Association. Um, the uh, recent decision on, uh, I guess it was May 3rd, uh, at the closing of Robinson Road has drawn um, our attention. Um, as uh, I would suspect was expected, uh, or hope was expected. Um, my request tonight is very simple, um, that we be permitted a public hearing um, so that we could voice our concerns, so that the issues could be clearly laid out. Um, I think you would appreciate the fact that there's a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, I'm concerned that the correct information would be out there, and be involved in the process. Cedar Ridge is not just any neighborhood, it's a very active neighborhood. Uh, that is a very important um, road uh, to our neighborhood and to the neighborhood around that, not just neighborhoods, but also businesses. And um, I understand that plans have been made, uh, creative solutions, 
To my knowledge, no one in our neighborhood has even been consulted, uh, asked. Uh, we live there. We drive the roads every day. Uh, we simply would ask for a public hearing um, so that we could um, have some communication. Uh, the communications that we have received uh, were first through the paper and then through a letter and, uh, and, and, and speaking with Mr. Harrigan um, in a phone call. So uh, that's my request on behalf of our neighborhood uh, tonight. Howard, if you'd allow me just a moment um, on behalf, of, part of my job as mayor is to make sure that, that uh, the public sentiment is brought into this discussion so I'm going to have to apologize to you on my behalf it's my fault for not uh, participating with the neighborhood uh, in that it was our understanding that um, that that part of the railroad the railroad who was there first counts and uh, it's my understanding that from about the river to almost <laughs> Old Morgantown Road the city was there first, so they have to give us a lot of leeway in whether or not a, a, a crossing is closed. In this case, they were there first, and we were using their right-of-way by permission, and they revoked their permission. And when they talked about having a public hearing, we should do that, and I apologize that we haven't done it. I'm afraid that if you come to the public hearing expecting a, a change, I don't know that CSX will will make their change, but we'll be happy to arrange that for you if you think that would benefit the neighborhood. Well, I think it benefits you guys as well. Um, I, I just think there's a lot of misinformation out there. Mm -hmm. um, I understand and barely aware of uh, all of the information and all of the policies and procedures and have learned more about railroads and things that I ever expected to um, in the last um, few weeks. Um, I, I, I think if, if at the very minimum, it's an olive branch. Of, of saying, um, because we have no defense. I mean, if your hands were tied, think of our hands. Um, and we had no voice except to respond to a, an editor or, uh, or to come here in that. And I think it's just we as citizens have no voice except for what voice we have through you guys. And so I think that's our, our desire and what has been expressed to me through um, our neighborhood. Um, and, and that is my desire, is just to kind of understand um, maybe there's nothing that can be done. Maybe there are some creative solutions. I know traffic counts have been done. Traffic counts do not accurately represent the importance of that road. Um, uh, when you figure in Emmett and when you figure the obstacle course you have to go through to get onto that side of the road, um, it's just significant. And to have had a 12 minute discussion in house on that. I know there were other discussions outside, but it, it just does not seem like our, we were very represented. And so we would like that opportunity. Yeah, a couple of questions. Um, what misinformation have you received? Uh, you know, I think, I think uh, Mayor Wilkerson expressed uh, uh, information that is not known. I mean, if. You're just a neighbor living in the city. You don't have any idea of the uh, regulations and the way. Um, I'm, I'm amazed at the power of a railroad. Um, we have it. That, but, but that is not, nobody, not everybody understands that in our neighborhood. And I think if no other reason, just to say that is, is, would be very helpful. I'm sure you're well aware that over a period of many years, uh, there have been more than two or three people killed at that crossing. Were you aware of that? There have been one killed. Um, it was, it was, was cited in the newspaper. Uh, there's been more than that. I've okay. lived in Bone Green all my life. I'm one may have newspaper. been the most recent, but uh, I'm talking about over a period of years, there has been more than one person killed at that crossing. Correct. Well, and, and that's, that begs another issue. I mean, that there... I'm, this is it's bigger than a 12-minute discussion. It's, I mean, because that issue is not going to go away. In fact, my fear is, the fear of the neighborhood is that that's actually going to escalate. Um, and the solution to that, we fear, is there's going to become a fence that's going to be put up, some barrier now that's going to be put up, and then that's going to be a rail yard, essentially, right on the edge of our neighborhood, right on the edge of a, a business, right behind the um, the the, the the apartment complexes, and I just think it's a serious, 
issue, the information that was in the paper seems to be incorrect in the saying that that was going to be a spur right there. No, it's a siding. And that's, that's, that was the clarification um, that we've received. There's, there's no new construction that's going to take place there. Okay. There's simply... Again, this is evidence of the information. Yes, yeah. I understand well, what you're talking uh, Would it... Mayor, may, yes, sir. Uh, a few years ago, maybe about 18 years or so, when I was first on the city commission, when I first came on, CSX wanted it to close four or five crossings off of the tracks going in the westerly direction. Johnny Webb was the mayor, and uh, in turn, they were going to donate some land to the city of Bowling Green to Operation Pride. We said no to CSX because it was a situation where you wouldn't be able to get on the west side without going all the way down to Morgantown Road or the new Morgantown Road. Uh, and I said that to say that CSX, uh, uh, they're not bulldozing over us in any kind of a way. Uh, we've had discussions on this and uh, uh, two things. One, we're gonna do what is right uh, and we're gonna protect our citizens in whatever we do. And I think that's the reason we thought that the closing of Robertson Lane was a good choice. Uh, I concur with the mayor. Uh, maybe we should have done some things differently. We didn't, but uh, I appreciate you being here. Yes, sir. I heard if uh, we can put on the agenda for the next meeting, which would be- June 7th. June 7th. Uh, we'll set aside a time. Um, I tell you what, since we meet at 4.30 and the neighborhood's working, why don't we put it at the end of the meeting and that way they'll have time to get here? Give me a time. Would, would you, can you give me an estimate of that? Depends on what's on the agenda. We'll June have, 7th is going to be a long agenda. It's so maybe uh, 5.30, 6 o'clock, mm -hmm. around in there. We'll, we will take recess and wait for them to come back if we end up early. Okay. And uh, uh, then we'll just make sure that the neighborhood hears the whole story from everybody on both sides. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Is that all right? All right. Uh, anyone else? Yes, sir. <coughs> Mr. Howard already checked in, so give him your name and address, please. No, no. Mm -hmm. I totally understand. Uh, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, if there's anyone who supports the Fairness Ordinance, please, you're invited to stand up. I'm Nathan Morgan, and I'm an ally. Moments ago, we just recited aloud the Pledge of Allegiance, something dear to our hearts, something we all learned as children and as American. Moments ago, we all spoke the final six words of the pledge. We did it together with liberty and justice for all, six words that embody your nation. With liberty and justice for all, not for some, not for those we choose, but for all. For every citizen of our country, state, county, and city. We are not a nation or even a city that should feel comfortable resting on injustice or silence. Louisville, Lexington, Frankfurt, Danville, Covington, Vico, and even Morgantown have all enacted fairness ordinances so that their citizens can be protected equally. There are zero legitimate reasons for our great city of Bowling Green to not join the ranks of Kentucky cities that have enacted this truly simple ordinance. However, before me, I see five reasons that this ordinance has not been enacted. Our commission's lack of action, understanding, and empathy disappoints me greatly, as it does many of our citizens, and the time has come for a change. This common sense piece of legislation, if enacted by our city, would have taken a fraction of the time that has now been spent because of the inactivity of the commission. However, I can assure you that this is not wasted time to the 1,000 citizens who have signed a, visit, a petition to get the Fairness Ordinance enacted, nor is it wasted time to the over 100 businesses that have signed on to show their support for the Fairness Ordinance as well. It is time as a citizen and as a human. I cannot understand what else you would like to see before enacting the simplest of laws to protect your constituents and help your town grow. As I just mentioned, we have over 1,000 signatures we have over 100 local businesses that directly contribute to our thriving economy that favor this piece of legislation. These are businesses that you eat at, shop at, and enjoy greatly. There is no reason to wait anymore. I see no one in these meetings coming to decry the Fairness Ordinance. 
Here I see people fighting for and hungry for a very simple change. We should listen to them and respond to them and not ignore them. Together we can make this simple and positive change. Together we can help erase hatred, bigotry, and discrimination from our beautiful city. Together we can help continue to help Bowling Green grow. All we need is four words added to an existing piece of legislation. And those four words aren't, is there anybody else? Thank you. Anyone else? All right, thank you. Moving on to the first item on our agenda, uh, second reading of Ordinance BG 2016-15. Ordinance rezoning real estate, ordinance rezoning tracts of land containing 16.11 plus or minus acres from RM2 to family residential to RS1D single family residential located at Fairground Addition Subdivision and Collett Addition Subdivision with various owners. So move. Second. Uh, by Hill, second by Denning. This is second reading. Again, it's been provided for you in your packet, passed unanimous, unanimously by the Planning Commission. Is there any other comments or discussion? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Hill? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Second reading of Ordinance BG 2016-16. Ordinance rezoning real estate, ordinance rezoning tracts of land containing 1.21 acres from GB General Business and P Public to HB Highway Business located at 1473 Kentucky Street, presently owned by Kentucky and Adams LLC. So moved. Second. By Hill, second by Chair Perigen. Again, second reading, uh, passed unanimously by the Planning Commission. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Hill? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2016-78. Municipal Order approving the promotion of Pete A. Samuels to the position of Athletic Supervisor in the Parks and Recreation Department. So move. Second. The Hill second by Denning. Mr. Febo. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, a vacancy occurred in this important position. Uh, we're here today to hear uh, uh, Brent Belcher's recommendation to fill this position. Brent. Thank you, Mr. Febo, Mayor, Commissioners. I come to you tonight uh, with another uh, proud recommendation for a promotion from uh, within our, our Bowling Green Parks uh, staff. Uh, Mr. DeFebo hit on a, we had a resignation at the end of January uh, of this year. We went out to uh, public for, uh, for applications. We got four, a total of 41 applicants. Uh, we, inter we did an interview, but uh, we, 21 of those were transferred to Bowling Green Parks for consideration. We actually did seven interviews. Uh, and out from those interviews, uh, we are proud to recommend, uh, let me get the name right, because I feel like his family uh, deserves the, the credit and himself for, the, for this, but it's uh, Ponermides Anastasios Samios, uh, better known as Pete, uh, is here. Uh, he's here with us today. Pete began as a referee with us in 1998, uh, and then he got a part-time employment, began full-time employment, uh, let me check my numbers here, in 2008. And since that time, uh, Pete, uh, without a doubt, is one of the hardest working individuals, with not only in Bowling Green Parks, within the city. Uh, very proud to, to say Pete's a co-worker, and uh, we know great things are in store for Pete. So uh, that's why we're here today. Thank you. Hand up, say everybody. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Hill? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Congratulations. Municipal Order 2016-79. Municipal Order approving the career path advancement of Adam D. Jepsit to the position of Operations Technician 1 in the Public Works Department. Second. Motion by Hill. Second by Williams. I believe it was in 2006 that we created uh, what is known as the career path uh, program in operations and public works to uh, enable uh, people who come to work for us to advance their skills through a series of, of tests. We're here proudly tonight to say that uh, Adam Jepson has uh, achieved all those uh, uh, testing measurements and we recommend him for operating Tech 1. Uh, I believe Adam's here. Session. Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Hill? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 
Municipal order approving the probationary appointment of Stacy L. Sanders to the position of Human Resources Specialist in the Human Resources and Risk Management Department. So moved. Second. A Hill second by Perigen, Mr. Fibbo. One of the earlier uh, realizations uh, of the city when we moved to uh, be a more diverse workforce was the need to uh, have the appropriate staffing to help us uh, achieve that goal, which takes some work. Uh, Tiger Tooley, as you know, has ascended to the primary person uh, to do that, and we're very happy with her performance and uh, her obvious success lately. Uh, we need additional <coughs> assistance to do some of the things that Tiger used to do, but is now devoted primarily to diversity. So we went out for uh, procurement. We had uh, 200 applicants uh, from that process. We're here tonight to recommend uh, Stacy Sanders. Uh, she's worked in HR in, in two private companies, one of which w was Fruit. Uh, we're, we're pretty happy about her, her skill set, and we recommend her for approval to the board. I believe Stacy's here. Congratulations to you as well. <laughs> Any other discussion? So that means she's going to be working with Tiger, is that right? Yes. Standing. <laughs> Please call the roll. Williams. Yes. Denning. Yes. Hill. Yes. Perigen. Yes. Wilkerson. Yes. Municipal Order 2016-81. Municipal Order approving the probationary appointment of Kristen N. Graves to the position of Community Center Coordinator in the Parks and Recreation Department. So move. Second. Motion by Hill. Second by uh, we uh, employ a community center coordinator at the Moxley Center to help with the programs, activities, and events. Uh, we went out to uh, initial advertisement and had 69 applicants. Through that vetting process, uh, Brent, as the leader of the department, uh, felt that we needed to go out for again for a second advertisement, which we did. We had 42 applicants at that time. Uh, we interviewed eight, and from that distillation, we feel that Kristen Graves is uh, the best candidate to help us coordinate the activities of Moxley. Uh, Kristen has a, a degree from WKU and has uh, performed some uh, recreational services at a place called Living Hope. Uh, so uh, I believe Kristen is here. Congratulations to you as well. Any other discussion? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Hill? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? You are welcome to slip out if you want. We're getting into the rest of the meeting now. Municipal Order 2016-82. Municipal Order authorizing and accepting bid number 2016-30 for fiscal year 2016 sidewalk construction program related to the Josephine Street and Collett Avenue project from Carter Douglas Company, LLC of Russellville, Kentucky in the amount of $148,338. So moved. Second. Motion by Hill, second by Perridge and Mr. Febo. As the commission knows, we're a community development block grant community, entitlement community, uh, and we've learned over the years it's best to aggregate our investments in the neighborhood. To that end, uh, Brent uh, Childers has uh, developed what is known as the neighborhood reinvestment area, in which we'll concentrate CDBG and other city resources to uh, effectuate uh, concentrated repairs in neighborhoods that are at risk. We're here tonight, uh, one of the flagship projects under this revitalization strategy is uh, to install 1,200 linear feet of sidewalk curb and gutter on Josephine Lane and Collett. We had three bidders, of which Carter Douglas is the lowest. Uh, Brent's here if you would like him to take a victory lap about the program. I'll answer questions. Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Hill? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2016-83. Municipal Order authorizing a change order to the contract with Contractors Floor Covering of Bowling Green, Kentucky in the amount of $34,737 related to bid number 2016-41 awarded through non-competitive negotiations. So moved. Second. Motion by Hill, second by Williams. Mr. Fibbo. As the commission knows, we are undertaking the uh, replacement of floor covering in the, the main foyer at, at the police department. 
uh, Doug Hawkins, ever mindful of the, uh, the look of the building, has uh, asked us if we'd be interested in replacing all of the uh, tile through the hallways and in, uh, in the uh, kitchen area. We thought it was a reasonable request. We had the contractor there, and so we're here tonight to ask you to approve a change order to allow us to do the whole job, so to speak, so we're not come back here two years later with the same problem. So Doug's here if you want to hear about uh, the extra need, but we felt it was reasonable and we thought we should go with it. I'll answer questions. Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Hill? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2016-84. Municipal Order authorizing and accepting bid number 2016-43 for records retention dry sprinkler system project from Vulcan Fire Systems Incorporated of Nashville, Tennessee in the amount of $99,100. So moved. Second. A hill second by Perridge and Mr. Febo. Believe it or not, this process we do produces records that are important for history and for other people, and we have a, a responsibility to maintain those in a reasonable way and by law. Uh, throughout the city in various buildings, we have records tucked here and there, as well as in private storage areas. So. One of the goals that we have, in, in, as you know, in our retreat was to uh, b build our first re records retention facility and program. The first step in that is to put in the uh, sprinkler system. It's a specialized sprinkler system uh, to allow us to uh, save the records. Uh, we went out to bid. We only had one bidder for, for the system. So we're here tonight to ask you to approve uh, the dry a Vulcan fire systems of Nashville to allow us to start the uh, process of uh, putting in our first uh, records retention uh, facility and program. Questions? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Hill? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2016-85. Municipal order approving the continuation of a contract with Community Action of Southern Kentucky Incorporated for transportation services for fiscal year 2017. So move. Second. Motion by Hill, second by Williams. Mr. DeFebo. Uh, we partner with Community Action of Southern Kentucky to provide transportation bus services to uh, people in our community. Um, we have a uh, two-year renewal we have an arrangement with them to renew the contract every every so often I believe every two years is that correct Brent two years every year excuse me uh, and the rough amount of the contract which will be established by what the, the feds and the state actually give us is about 1.2 million dollars uh, this for this money uh, community action is responsible for providing uh, transportation services I think Ken is here. If you have any questions, uh, Donna here. No, sir. Well, and if you have any questions for community action, gave, huh? I already gave Ken down the road before I, the meeting started. So. Okay. Uh, but this is just a renewal of uh, a relationship we already had uh, with them. Uh, Brent's here. If you have any nuance about the interaction between uh, all these funds and community action. I'll answer questions. I, one comment I'd just like to say that I've noticed the improvement in the services over the years and they continue to get better and better. So I'm happy for them. Do a good job. Anything else? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Denning? <laughs> Hill? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes, Ed, and he make an amendment to take out the tornado shelters you call bus <laughs> shelters. So, you know, municipal order 2016-86. Municipal order authorizing and approving an agreement through non-competitive negotiations for professional engineering services for the Parks and Recreation Department Lovers Lane Lovers Lane Soccer Complex Restroom Pavilion Expansion Project. <laughs> with Branstetter Carroll Incorporated of Lexington, Kentucky, in the total amount not to exceed $31,000. So moved. Thank you. A hill second by week. I think it would be an understatement to say that uh, soccer is not a hot sport in, in Bowling Green. Any time, I live near the, this, the Lover's Lane soccer complex and it's always packed. Uh, one of its needs and the need you recognize was to build a, a new restroom pavilion uh, to meet the needs of both players and their family. 
we wanted to fast track this. We, we sunshined it to you at retreat. We're here tonight to ask you to allow us to hire Brant Stetter Carroll uh, to bring this project in uh, from to bid. Um, it's also important to note that we in-house and public works department are also looking at developing uh, some walking trails at, at Lover's Lane we would design in-house. There would be both an internal loop and an external loop. We'll do that on our own, but we thought we should mention that today that we have that greater vision. But this part's just for the bathrooms, which are greatly needed, as well as uh, a pavilion uh, representative of the organizations that play there. Uh, Brent's here if you have any questions. Comments or questions? Ms. Collarone? Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Hill? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2016-87. Municipal Order accepting donation from John and Linda Kelly Family Charitable Foundation in, to expand the scope of services of Camp Happy Days. A Hill second by Denning. Mr. DeFebo. Uh, this is uh, a simple resolution to uh, thank John and Linda Kelly for $19,138 to uh, help uh, expand Camp Happy Days to uh, special needs uh, adults over 18 years of age. This will allow us to uh, add the counselors needed to provide the quality of care uh, needed. We obviously want to thank John and Linda and uh, Brent's here if you have any questions about the program or how we're going to use the money. After the city, we want to thank the Kelly family. This is many years they've been helping us by participating in the Camp Happy Days program, and it's uh, very helpful to us. Thank you so much. Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Hill? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. First reading of Ordinance BG 2016-17. Ordinance rezoning real estate, ordinance rezoning tracts of land containing 80.69 acres from AG Agriculture and OPC, Office Professional Commercial, with a general development plan, to PUD planned unit development with a general development plan, located on Lover's Lane, presently owned by Green Hills Development Partners, LLC. So moved. Second. Yep. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, ben Peterson's here. If you would, uh, he would entertain any questions you may have. Questions over the pack and zoning voted unanimously for the project. Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Hill? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2016-88. Municipal Order authorizing the mayor to execute a lease agreement with Downtown Redevelopment Authority Incorporated to lease Circus Square Park for concerts in the park. So moved. Second. Motion by Hill, second by Williams. Mr. DeFebo. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, it's that time of year again where uh, concerts in, in the park are going to be occurring. Uh, that relationship between us and DRA is uh, reflected in the lease, and I, I think it would be appropriate for Gene Harmon to outline the parameters of the lease. Gene? Uh, this is our typical, uh, I guess, continuation mini-year agreement with uh, DRA for the Friday night concerts in the park. Uh, the main reason they're coming before us is they have to have permission and consent from the city uh, to be on that property to apply for the liquor license. That's the major reason we come. Uh, normal, typical conditions in this is that, uh, you know, they have to keep it clean, they have to maintain it, you know, it's basically lease it to them uh, so they can then put it on their ABC application. I mean, this is like, I forgot how many years, but a, a long time of years we've done this. Provide insurance. Excuse me. They provide insurance as well. Yes, they do. Uh, liability and liquor liability as well. Comments or questions? Program going again, so please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Hill? Yes. <laughs> Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. That's the last voting item we have on the agenda. We have a presentation now on the annual operating budget for fiscal year 2016-17. Mr. Febo, you got a crew to come up tonight. Commission, it's uh, my pleasure again this year uh, to present uh, 
to this board uh, the 2016-17 budget. Uh, this is a process, as you know, which starts with the will of this board to, as expressed uh, to me and the city manager and to the senior management staff, uh, brought to light with the input of our employees and department heads, uh, as well as our contract agencies, and formed into recommendation through the efforts of what is known as the budget team. Uh, members of that team are myself, uh, Katie Schaller, uh, Jeff Meisel, uh, Michael Grubbs, and Aaron Ballou. Uh, after I'm done with this initial preamble, uh, they will take turns uh, presenting elements of the budget. Uh, you, as the Board of Commission, have until June 30th to uh, uh, review and um, make changes uh, to and hopefully approve uh, the budget before you. Um, every budget has a theme. The last five years, the city uh, has been fighting a tenacious recession that has uh, handicapped our ability to do a, a number of things. Uh, that recession is now over. Uh, the city is enjoying modest growth. But I think it's important for us to remember that even during the most difficult of times, this board and your staff still provided basic services. We still were able to uh, provide highly prioritized capital needs. Uh, we never cut uh, public safety positions during that whole five-year period. Uh, we added no new debt. We didn't do the illusion of saying everything's okay by taking from fund balance. Uh, we essentially uh, cut our, our cost footprint. There's no secret sauce here. Uh, we're doing better today because we, for two reasons. One is that we have a lower cost footprint that was created by the hard times of the last five years, and also because uh, we went without many needs. And finally, uh, things are improving, as you can see by our, our, our revenue uh, forecast. Um, the challenge this year will be to try to uh, meet some of those legitimate pent-up demands without putting uh, new unsustainable pressure on our operating budget. That's, that's our challenge this year. Uh, hopefully this, this balance was accomplished in the budget that you will hear. Um, you'll hear presentations on revenue, operating expenses, capital, debt load, and contractual agencies. Uh, some of the highlights, uh, for the 14th year, it'll be uh, no tax uh, increase recommended. Uh, to, we have also are asking you to increase our right off the top fund balance from 20 to 25%. We're proud to say that our AA2 bond rating is still intact. We're also proud to say that we're going to be spending $15 million uh, for our community. It's uh, an important note. Uh, since 2008, the hard times, uh, because of our ability to reduce our cost footprint and to uh, husband our money over the years, we were able to avoid $33 million in debt by paying for cash. And if you look around this room, one of the fruits of those efforts are this city hall. In this budget, we continue the big three. That would be sidewalks, storm, water, and paving. Uh, especially noteful is the fact that the paving budget has been increased 53% to $2 million, the highest uh, amount ever put. Um, I've been here 10 years, and during that time, except for the early period, we haven't uh, hired any police officer. Uh, we're proud to recommend that the city uh, add two new police officers. They're really not new. We have them on the street now. We're just uh, officially funding a position, but it will increase our, uh, our patrol census over time. We have in this budget a modest increase for employee wages, and we continue our aggressive efforts uh, to help uh, our partners create jobs in this community. Uh, hopefully, this budget reflects what our citizens want from their city government. One, 
to deliver the best possible uh, services at the lowest appropriate cost. Uh, two, to foment and partner with others to create new jobs. Three, to invest in this place we call home and do it by living within its means. Um, next, I would, uh, we'd like to start the process. Uh, I asked uh, Jeff Lashley, uh, Jeff Lashley, oh, sorry. Jeff Meisel, sorry, uh, to come uh, forward. Uh, he's a man of uh, great integrity and great professionalism and he's here to uh, uh, present to you the revenue picture of this, of this city. Jeff? Thank you, Ke Thank you Kevin. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit. Um, gonna give you an overview of all funds and then we'll probably uh, we're gonna we will uh, focus on the general fund for the most part and the revenue side w would like to just touch on a few things before we get started uh, we take a conservative but realistic approach in our revenue projections I think you all have observed that over the years what this does is it helps set parameters for the expenditure budget and it provides us some margin of error uh, having a margin of, an error, margin of error with revenues, I think, is a prudent strategy because uh, it provides for better resiliency. <coughs> and uh, if and when leaner times come, we, we have that cushion to, to lean on. Uh, another benefit of this realistic approach, what I'll call a realistic approach with revenues, is that when you keep operating expenses under control, any revenue growth can be applied to the capital project funding, like Kevin mentioned. And this is another reason, another way we've, we've been able to keep tax rates low with no increases since 2003. And it's also provided funding for capital projects and allowed, allowed us to avoid new debt issues. We haven't issued debt since 2008 with the ballpark. And this has also resulted in a steady reduction of our outstanding debt, existing debt. And what this does is it gives us a better opportunity when we do have refinancings to come along gets us better interest rates, having that uh, steady trend of reducing our existing debt. Uh, most of the projections you're getting ready to see are based on nine months through, through March. That's usually all we have to go through, go with. Uh, we're just now receiving April's uh, in this week. But you, we're based, based it on nine months, then we look at the last three months of the prior year, which is FY15, and then we try to project how we're gonna finish out the year. Uh, we take those projections and we make the decision of whether or not we can sustain it going forward or if there's other circumstances that point differently, different direct, di different trends. So most revenue lines are basically, uh, we're going to just reflect the current reality of things and current state of affairs. And we're basically in a lot of cases, most cases, adjusting the FY16 budget to reality and then what we think we can sustain going forward. So the first slide here. First slide gives you a comparison of the um, FY16 adopted to the FY17 recommended. As you can see, uh, we're, we're recommending all, all funds are going to go to about a million or yeah, a million eleven, 111 million, sorry. Um, and that is about a 9% growth uh, versus the FY16 adopted. And then skipping down there, the general fund is showing about 8% uh, growth, 65 million, 73 compared to the 60 million, 260 for this current year. Uh, we think we're probably gonna finish pretty close to the 65 million this year. So when you really compare it to actuals of this year, it's, it's again gonna be a really very flat conservative budget. This next slide here is just your all funds uh, by category. The uh, taxes there would be your property taxes in your general fund, and all, as well as your insurance premium taxes in the fire improvement fund, showing 5.4% there. 
Uh, occupational taxes, we take in those in, in three different funds. It's the, it's the general fund, parks improvement fund, and the job development fund showing about 9% there. We'll look at the general fund here in just a second. The uh, license and permits line there, the big increase there is 22, 23%. A lot of that's gonna be found in your building fees, plan review fees, and electric permit fees and ABC. As you know, there's a lot of activity going on uh, out there, construction, especially the Transpark and other places. Uh, we rely on uh, Brent's advice there with what the future looks like, and we think uh, this budget needed adjusting, so we're, we're adjusting it up. About $250,000, I think most of that's in the general fund. The intergovernmental is, I'm sorry, the in, whoop, let me go back. Intergovernmental is uh, all your grants and, and your other funds like Section 8, BG Transit, CDBG, Greenways, Homeland Security, 911, Liquid Fuel Tax, and Cold Mineral, fat, cold mineral Tax. We're looking at a slight increase there, about 3.6%. The fees, uh, biggest piece of those at 3173 is uh, the WKU payment that we get for their debt service on the Diddle, Diddle Arena bonds. I know it's a funny place for it, but we couldn't really classify it anywhere else, so that's a big part of that. It's about $2.6 million a year that we receive, and we're not out any money on that bond issue for the, for the dental arena project that was done back in 2003. Uh, other things in that category uh, include property tax collection fees for, for the uh, city schools, and then some public safety fee fees and code enforcement. Uh, charging for services here, or my, my biggest piece of, there, of that is the fleet lease maintenance payments, about 1.9, and then you got your parks and rec, that's including golf and aquatics now, and then your miscellaneous line there includes things like your healthcare uh, premiums paid by employees, employers, uh, your P&F contribution, uh, the money coming back in for the ITA debt service from the county, uh, 800 radio fees, rental income, interest, all that kind of stuff. And then transfers in uh, is all your transfers between funds that occur. This is uh, two looks here of your all funds, how the money comes in and your general fund. As you can see, the biggest piece of the pie on both sides is your occupational fees, 70% in the general fund and about 43% overall in all funds. Uh, next piece in the general fund is your property taxes and, uh, and other taxes. And then on all funds, though, it happens to be your transfers that go back and forth. Um, next slide here, uh, maybe around how long is we're getting ready to get into the general fund. This is kind of a five-year look back, going back to FY12. Uh, as you can see, FY12 is Kind of the first year we start recovering from the recession. I'll show you a 10 year just here in a second, but uh, FY12 to FY17 that we're projecting is about a $15 million growth. And that's about a 20, I think at a 26, 28% overall growth, which is an average of about five or 6% a year, which has been pretty steady. The 2014 to 15 increase there, the 53, 0.6 to the 58.9 includes the addition of golf and aquatics to uh, the general fund. Here's your look back to FY07. Um, FY07 was the last year of the 2% occupational tax. Full effect of that went into uh, FY08. And then as you can see, uh, we, we kept adjusting down to 09. Uh, FY09 to 10 was a little flat, no real increase, and then the recession was going on about that same time too. And our lowest point of the recession really hit us in FY11, and as you can see after that, we've kind of climbed out of it from uh, 12 to 16. Now, I'd like to go into just basic categories on the, the general fund. Uh, we're projecting property tax growth this year of about 4.9% in the general fund, uh, roughly 550000 And 
then uh, that includes uh, your motor vehicle, your personal property, your real estate property. Uh, we're basing this on the fact that we've got a preliminary assessment from the PBA that showed about a 5.9% growth. So it's really good. Uh, I think about 3.6 of it for, was for existing growth and we had about 2.3 in new property growth. Um, other taxes there include your insurance premium taxes, along with your bank franchise and your telecommunications tax, showing a little bit of growth there too, about 4.2%. And as you know, here's our biggest piece, the occupational taxes. We are gonna project about an 8.8% growth overall uh, on occupational, breaking that down, your withholding and nets at the 1.5%, we still separate it between 1.5 and uh, the 0.35. So we can look back and see what's true growth and what's due to the fact that the, the tax rate change. Maybe we get a little further down the road, we can we look start combining it again, the 185. But it's showing about we're going to do about a six percent increase in nets, and we're going to do about a two a 9.5 percent increase in your withholding fees. Uh, the service enhancement fees represent another 664,000 increase and. Um, 10-year average on occupational tax growth is running about 4.4%. Five-year average is 3.7, and then a three-year average, we've now had some good years here recently. We're looking at a 5.9% growth, three-year average growth there. Uh, next one is your license and permits. This is where your building fees, plan review fees, electric permit fees, and ABC come into play, projecting about $225,000 of growth in that category. Uh, general fund grants, really there's not much to speak of there anymore. We've moved most of those out to the other uh, special revenue funds. Uh, next slide is your charges for services. This includes your cemetery, uh, along with school tax, city school tax collection fees, public safety fees, code enforcement fees, uh, section eight inspection fees and fireworks, uh, showing Pretty flat there, not much growth anticipated. We're gonna keep that about the same. Same thing for Parks and Rec. Uh, looking about uh, very conservative there uh, on prop and prop Parks and Rec, including golf and aquatics. And then this last slide would be uh, your miscellaneous. And what we're doing there is miscellaneous includes things like interest earnings, uh, rental fees, uh, Sell of, a, sell of property, we've had really uh, good success with our auctions, thanks to Maryland, uh, making some money there with our turning over some old assets. And so we uh, increased that budget, I think about 76,000. And then the other rest of that increase is based on interest. We've, we've put some money back into play and invested it. Uh, we had about five or six million in, in general fund. We were kind of waiting to see what, if we needed it or not. We put that back into play with some, some decent investments and we anticipate some increased interest earnings on that money going forward. Uh, and then the other line there is your transfers in. That's the money coming back from Heartland Development Area back into golf. So that's your, uh, here's your summary in, in a, a nutshell again for the general fund, looking at 8% overall increase from FY16 adopted to FY17 recommended. And I can, I guess, take questions if you want to now or Any questions for Mr. In, however you want to do it. But I'm going to turn things over to Katie to, uh, to, enter, to uh, explain the expenditure budget. Thank you, sir. All right, I'm going to turn your attention to the expenses. And again, we're just going to kind of look back to the first slide we had. Uh, it compares our revenues and expenditures for the adopted year for FY16 compared to where we think we're going to end FY16 uh, to where we're projecting to budget for FY17. The uh, FY7, FY16 adjusted budget, uh, you'll notice we do have uh, a deficit there of about $5.4 million. Uh, we don't actually expect to, to um, spend $65.8 million. Mm -hmm by the end of this fiscal year, but that's where we are right now. At the end of each year, we close out the budget, carry projects, 
cut, carry money forward for projects and open POs. And so that projects that number forward a little bit further on the expense side. For FY17, we propose to use just over about $4.2 million of previously saved money to balance out the all funds budget. Uh, most of this is uh, related to capital projects and purchases, basically 3.7 million of that amount. And then we also have anticipated increases in the health care fund that makes up the 4.2 million there. And for the third consecutive year, as previously mentioned, we're not proposing to use any fund balance to balance the general fund. In order to break these categories down just a little bit further, uh, we're looking at the FY17 all funds budget at this particular slide. In FY16 adopted budget, uh, we're projecting 12% increase, uh, basically from 16 to 17, $12.3 million. And the increase is primarily in uh, personnel expenses, which we'll go into further detail later on in this presentation. The proposed capital projects and purchases account for the majority of the increases in contractuals, fixed assets, and transfers out. The nearly $128,000 increase in subsidies is mostly due to the expected increase in the TIF money to be paid out next year. And the debt service continues to decline, as mentioned previously, with the refinancing uh, that we've been able to do in the past couple of years. Excluding capital, the all funds budget is up about two point the all funds operating budget is only up about 2.3% or $2.1 million compared to the FY16 operating budget. We feel that's a pretty modest growth. From these two pie charts, you can see that public safety expenditures account for over 25% of the all funds budget and 39% of our general fund budget. The other remaining departments combined account for 48% of the all funds and 41% of the general fund with debt and transfers out, rounding out the rest of the pie. With the general fund uh, accounting for about 56.5% of the all funds budget, we have a tendency to want to focus more in detail on the general fund versus any of the other funds that we have. And the changes in expenditures from FY16 to 17, you can see basically an 8% increase that is based on the revenue projections that we have. We are taking into account uh, those revenue projections and we're covering all the operating expenses and the included uh, $8 million in capital projects uh, for this next year in FY17. You'll notice too from the five year look back, since FY 2012 there has been a uh, $12.6 million increase in expenditures. Of that, $2.5 million is attributable to the aquatics and golf, which came in in FY15. Again, a 10-year look back here. We're comparing our personnel expenses, which is our largest expense of about 56.5% of the general fund budget with the total expenditures. And again, very similar to the revenue, uh, chart that we showed previously, you can see the, the dip during the recession and now we're coming out of that uh, with some modest growth. However, you will note that the personnel line has remained relatively flat, if not decreased, uh, through the years despite giving COLA step adjustments and dealing with changes in the CERS rates which are beyond our control. This has been accomplished, accomplished in large part by right-sizing the workforce, combining jobs, changing some of the full-time positions to part-time, eliminating positions where feasible, and holding non-public safety positions vacant for a period of time. The established cost for the FY16 uh, budget includes, the estimated cost, I'm sorry, for the FY16 budget also reflects some of the overfilling uh, that we've done, the overhiring for police and fire positions in anticipation of upcoming retirements. Again, with personnel being the largest expense type that we have, this chart breaks down the various components that make up our personnel costs and provide more detail to the variations of, uh, that are attributed to the increases. The other personnel cost line includes medical, dental, vision, life insurance, workers' comp, and unemployment expenditures. And then the total other benefits line is primarily tuition reimbursement and cell phone stipend reimbursements to employees. Overall, we're looking at about a 3.5% increase. Uh, we did have some CRS changes. Non-hazardous went up. 
hazardous with down, went down that help offset those expenses. As the expenditure budget is prepared, and the budget team works on this with the departments, uh, we scrutinize very diligently all of the expenses that the departments have and all the department heads will tell you. Uh, we sit in those meetings and we say, okay, can you reduce this? We look at the history of something else and it, we really do look at those line items. And we consider the historical trends, we look at all the actual needs and we factor in other uh, items of determination to make the, the budget be the most appropriate, the right amount for each of those line items. We do cut costs and we extract savings wherever we can. Increases in software maintenance in the IT budget, additional elective special education for police and additional advertising money for HR to help reach more potential applicants are what make up the increase in the contractual services line. The increase in supplies, about $281,000, is primarily due uh, to athletics taking over the Bowling Green Athletic Association process with softball programs and different uh, other programming. We've also increased our maintenance supply budget to purchase additional salt product in order to replenish our stock from this last year's winter, which was pretty extensive. Uh, so we have increased that budget about $47,000. And then the rest of it uh, in, is made up in supplies for replacing some AR rifles in the police department. That's a capital project we have. And then also to continue the expansion of the surveillance cameras at the various park locations. And we have two additional parks uh, included in this year's budget. And that makes up basically what your supply lines are. And then the fixed assets are actually going down because we do have fewer proposed capital purchases in the next budget year. Amy, yes, sir. Would you say it was in, in the contractual services? Uh, contractual services include uh, any professional services that we have. It includes utilities, it includes uh, training, special education, uh, construction costs, uh, other improvements. And what we've got right now is software maintenance and the IT budget is one of the driving factors in that increase. Uh, and then we had some additional uh, special education costs related to police and then we also had some additional advertising money for the HR budget. Again, that goes along with our proposal to continue the diversification of our um, workforce. Any further questions on that? Okay. And those changes actually net out. I mean, there, there's several other changes that have occurred that were decreases. Those are just the, the three probably largest increases that we uh, experienced, but it nets out to only about a $54,000 increase in contractual services, despite the fact that we have utility rates significantly increasing next year. The majority of the increase in the general fund subsidies and assistance is related to the proposed increase in agency appropriations, which we'll discuss further at the end of this presentation. An increase in contingency funds for FY17, which is your miscellaneous line, is proposed for next year. Uh, one, because we are proposing a $65 million budget, we feel like we need to have a little bit more money in contingency, and that $500,000 is still less than 1% of the total general fund budget. And that money will help us cover any unforeseen um, things that may happen throughout the year. We could have some additional costs that we're not aware of. Pricing could go up on other products or utility rates could increase mid-year um, more so than they already expected to do. So we have that money available um, to use as needed. But we do look at that. We use that money very carefully. We monitor it and we don't access it unless necessary. The increase in the transfers out is directly related to the proposed capital improvement program for the FY17 budget. As Mr. DeFebo mentioned earlier, we are increasing uh, the general fund contribution for the overlay program of $800,000 to make that a total of a $2 million budget. Part of that money will come from the liquid fuel tax and then $800,000 of it is coming from general fund. We're also increasing the money going toward the new sidewalk construction program by $100,000 the past couple of years, we've done, or traditionally, we've done about $400,000 a year to that program. This next year, we're doing $500,000. And then we're also addressing, as previously mentioned, um, some past due and really needed equipment replacement uh, for public works and parks and rec. When I was looking at those uh, budgets and those requests, we have um, equipment that dates back to the 1970s and 1980s. 
So it's, it's time to replace some of those things. And we're also putting $2.3 million into expanding the park and recreation facilities and features uh, which were proposed in the park's master plan. The general fund also continues to support capital projects for stormwater mitigation, small house improvements, small house road improvements, and then technology enhancements. Again, all of that is identified in the transfers outline and makes up that $3 million increase. The general fund operating budget, when we take all the capital out of the picture, is only 2.6% up compared to last year. Uh, and this equates to about a $1.4 million increase, the vast majority of which ties directly back to changes in personnel um, that we're proposing, cost of living adjustments and step increases. Again, we'll present that in just a few more minutes. And that concludes my portion of this uh, particular part of the expenditure budget. I want to turn it over to Erin Ballou, and she's going to talk about um, our debt service requirements, our projected fund balance, and then take a final look at the expenditures for... Katie, before she steps away. Thank you. Welcome back. Good afternoon. Thank you. Okay, this chart summarizes the debt service requirements for the recommended FY217 year um, compared against the current 2016 year. You'll see that we're recommending a budget of about a little over $5 million, and that's actually a decrease um, compared to our current estimated year that we're in now. Um, so we're actually recommending $560,000 less than this year due to the recent refinancings that we've done in about the last year or so. Um, those three refinancings that are affecting this new year budget are the refinancings for the ITA bonds, um, the ballpark bonds, and then the 2007 bonds. Can you step just a little close to the microphone? You sound like me talking. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, it's also important to note that we're, again, um, recommending no new debt in 2017. Um, as was mentioned earlier, we haven't um, recommended any debt since 2008 was the last issue we had. Um, with the ballpark, and also um, whenever you exclude the ballpark, all of our debt outstanding right now will be paid off by 2034. So within about 18, 20 years, the only debt we'll have left as of right now will be the ballpark bonds, and those are a few years um, beyond that. This next slide shows the full funding picture for all the city's debt service, um, not just the general fund. Um, you'll see the general fund is the biggest slice of this pie, 42.7 percent. That, as you saw, it's five million dollars next year. Um, the next biggest piece are reimbursements. Those are from WKU for 100 percent of their debt that's on our books, and also from Warren County, where they pay us half of the ITA debt service. Um, next year, that's estimated to be about 3.7 million from those two entities. Um, the special revenue funds, which consists primarily of the fire improvement fund and also the job development fund, um, that makes up about 20% of debt service funding. Next year, it's about $2.4 million. Um, and finally, the convention center is the enterprise um, fund. It's about, or it provides about 6% or $700,000 of debt service funding. Um, in 2018, about half of that special revenue debt will um, fall off our books. It'll be retired. And then the year after that, in 2019, that enterprise debt will also be retired. So those two pieces will um, be smaller in the coming years. Okay, this slide shows um, what we expect for a beginning fund balance in the general funds next year. We are estimating a beginning fund balance of around $20 million. Um, that includes our um, expenditure and revenue projections. Um, the staff has forecasted through June 30th. That also includes um, all the recommendations we're making to you tonight for the FY17 budget. So of that $20 million we have after those things, um, you see the next line is the committed fund balance. Um, we also refer to that as our reserves. Um, that is equal to 25% of our adopted revenue budget in the general funds for FY17. Um, in the past, that's been 20%, so we're recommending to increase that to 25%. Um, our current balance in that account now is about $12 million. So we're looking to increase that by over $4 million next year. That increase um, will be used to help us safeguard against the volatility in, um, as you noticed, our biggest revenue in the general fund is occupational wages or wage taxes. Um, so that additional $4 million will help us offset any changes in that. 
And um, as Jeff mentioned, it will also help our credit ratings in the future. When we go to do additional refinancings, it'll help us secure debt at lower interest rates, so our debt service um, costs will continue to be low. Right, after that, um, you notice, or um, Katie mentioned, that we are using no fund balance next year to balance our general fund. So that $3.8 million you see will be available for other items that may come up throughout the year. So um, any significant events that occur um, or significant repair expenses, um, that $3.8 million will be available. This slide compares expenditures, the total general fund expenditures that Katie started on um, for FY17 compared to FY16. Um, you'll see that's an 8% increase um, this year, or <coughs> FY17 over 16. Um, but that also corresponds with what Jeff um, showed you with the revenue budget. So that 8% equals about $4.8 million. Um, another way to look at that, Katie mentioned, our operating budget is only up 2.6% next year. But if you look at our capital budget, our capital budget in the general fund increases to $8.1 million next year. Um, currently, in this current year in FY16, it's only 3.7. So that's a $4.4 million increase in our capital budget. Um, and you can notice that's going to be in the miscellaneous and transfer outlines, where we're up 32% next year. Okay, and this slide compares um, all expenditure, expenditures and all funds by type um, to the general fund. It's pretty easy to see the personnel expenses are definitely the biggest piece of both of, both of those pies. Um, in the general fund, um, personnel expenditures are 56.5% next year. Um, and in all funds, we're reckon it's, it'll be about 35%. Um, yet even though those are the largest percentages on those pies, it's important to note that last year those percentages were even more. So even though we've increased our personnel costs, we're proposing to increase our personnel costs in FY17. Um, we've been able to control that cost to where, um, as part of the whole city cost, um, it's actually a smaller piece of those pies in 17. Okay, that's all I have. I'll hand it off to Mike um, for discussion on personnel and capital improvement plan. Any questions for Ms. Blue? Thank you very much. Mr. Krebs, you look very nice this evening. Thank you, sir. Um, I had a request from the mayor to read all my slides tonight, so uh, <laughs> we'll be taking... No, you didn't say that. Uh, I do have the opportunity to talk to you more specifically about how we're going to spend all this money that we're going to bring in this year, so I kind of have the fun job. Uh, first, I'll talk about personnel services. Um, obviously, we have a number of recommendations in the uh, budget pertaining to wages, positions, uh, and the uh, composition of our workforce. Uh, most of the $1.4 million that was mentioned that the general fund will go up this year uh, for non-personnel, uh, non-capital, excuse me, is for personnel. Uh, this is for raises for part-time, full-time employees, uh, a few additional positions, uh, one upgrade, and then also some changes in our benefits, some of which are mandated costs. Uh, this chart is one that the budget team has um, looked at periodically over time, so it's interesting to compare our two largest our largest revenue source and the largest expenditure uh, category. If you look at 2010, um, the lighter color number is the occupational fee and the darker is the personnel cost. Back in 2010, our personnel costs were more than what we bring in with our, our largest revenue source. Uh, now we're in the other situation where there's a difference of two and a half million dollars, more that we're bringing in in occupational fees compared to our personnel costs, which obviously provides additional money for, for capital. Uh, we are recommending a cost of living adjustment for employees this year, uh, and the recommendation is 2%. Given here an example of, of the COLA that we gave the last two years, so it's somewhat in line with what we've done the last two years. Uh, the number is higher than what the increase in the consumer price index was for last year. Um, we feel justified in recommending the slightly higher amount partly because of market conditions, have, market conditions having improved, and then also uh, employee take-home pay is going to be affected by some things that I'll go over in a couple of minutes. Uh, we also provide eligible employees with a step or merit increase. Um, that will cost, uh, be an average of about 1.27 across the workforce. Employees that are in the lower uh, 
part of their pay grade, the percentage is a higher increase than if you're at the top of the pay grade. Uh, but that's an average of 1.27. For an entry level police officer or firefighter, it's around 1.64%. Uh, but not all employees get that step increase for various reasons, so the overall impact on the budget is going to be just a little bit over 1%. I will also recommend an increase for our part-time and seasonal employees. Uh, an average of 2% COLA is around 20 cents an hour. Uh, in, in all cases, we adjust the minimum and the maximum pay rates in our pay schedule by whatever the COLA is. So that helps us with um, attracting new employees also because of the discussion nationally about increasing the minimum wage. This also helps to prepare us in case uh, that increase does occur. And those employees, part-time employees or seasonal employees who've been with us over a year, are also eligible for a 10 cent step increase. Um, and elected officials uh, don't benefit as much as the other employees, but by state law, um, you're only eligible for the CPI increase issued by the Department of Local Government, which will be 0.7%. So again, uh, being elected official doesn't really pay off that well. Uh, there are... Um, a couple other uh, adjustments that will have to be made that relate to state uh, sworn personnel and police and fire will get an increase in their training incentive to $4,000 a year from the current $3,100. Uh, there is an impact to the city budget because of our cost for overtime and for fringe will go up and those are not, um, they're not reimbursed by the state. And also, um, employees participating in the retirement system, their contribution has not been subject to FICA or FICA Medicare taxes uh, due to a court case and IRS regulations. Uh, those contributions are going to be taxable as of the 1st of January, so that's going to impact take-home pay for employees. Uh, the city budget is also impacted, but we have been budgeting the full cost. We just haven't been spending the full cost. Um, so it didn't, impact, it didn't really impact our budget, but will it, it will impact how much the city is actually spending um, because of, of that taxable contribution. Um, as far as classification changes, we do have one recommendation on a full-time position uh, due to a change in job duties. Uh, the public works inspector is going to take on uh, doing subdivision inspections, so we felt that an upgrade was justified. We also have a number of part-time positions in parks and recreation that we are adding hours um, to primarily for taking over duties for the Bowling Green Athletic Association. Those additional hours uh, with all those part-time positions is the equivalent of 4.2 full-time equivalents, uh, but none of those employees will be receiving uh, employee benefits. We do have five new positions recommended. Uh, already mentioned was uh, we're overfilled uh, right now with uh, police officers, and so we're going ahead and taking two of those positions that are currently filled and making them permanent, uh, which will be the first increase uh, in, since 2009. Uh, already mentioned is we're getting ready to renovate part of the City Hall Annex for records retention, and we would hire a management coordinator um, to manage, organize and manage that facility. And then adding back two positions that we previously had and that were eliminated uh, during the recession. Uh, one is a laborer position in public works operations to help during the winter months with snow removal and provide support the rest of the year and that also would free up personnel to help with our inspections. And a position in public works administration office that was full time, uh, then was eliminated, then we brought back part time, will be full time again. We're also recommending several new part-time positions, most of which uh, relate to BGAA. We're adding one seasonal position uh, to help parks maintenance with additional work they've taken on, and we're adding 10 positions uh, because of the BGAA situation, umpires and scorekeepers. Uh, this chart shows kind of overall what's happened with the city workforce over several years. Uh, but again, uh, we're still down in terms of total full-time personnel comparing to 2008, and the all-other category is still down uh, as well. So even though we're adding five full-time positions, uh, the total number of full-time positions is still down compared to where it was several years ago. How many full-time equivalents are that? Um, I don't actually know the full-time equivalent. The full-time total is 456, but when you add all the part-time uh, the part-time employees probably add another 180 FTEs, but full-time personnel is 456 in the new budget. 
Uh, we also want to show you the, um, the rate history with CERS. We have been fortunate over the last few years that uh, the rates have, have slowed down, rate increases have slowed down, and as Katie mentioned, um, the hazardous duty rate dropped uh, this year uh, by 5.7 percent, but for non-hazardous it's gone up 9.5 percent. We actually had a savings in this year's budget of $146,000 before you add in the COLA and the new personnel. Uh, switching gears to the employee medical plan, um, we made some changes to the plan back in 2009 and we went four years without a significant increase in our costs. Uh, however, um, the last three years we have seen increases. We've had some high claimants and also the Affordable Care Act has had some impact on us. Uh, the budget next year does include a modest increase in premiums for employees. We're also making some changes to the uh, prescription copay for the first time in 10 years. Um, we're actually lowering the generic copay from $15 to $7. Uh, the preferred or formulary copay won't change, but there will be higher copays for non preferred and specialty. But again, these are very reasonable compared to the kind of costs that are occurring, occurring in the market and that the city is actually incurring. Uh, this chart uh, shows for you, you know, the total cost of the medical plan over the years. Again, 2008 to 12, basically no change. Then we had a spike in 13, a drop in 14, again a raise in 15, and again uh, more in 16. So uh, hopefully the uh, addition of our uh, city care center, the employee on-site health center this year will help us with summer costs. Uh, we'll also be getting a lot more deeply into uh, wellness services as a result of that center. These charts, uh, again, kind of summarize uh, the total personnel expenditures. Uh, general fund, as well as all funds, police and fire and the general fund are 61%, and the obvious other departments or groupings make up the bulk of that. So any, um, uh, just kind of in review, uh, we're recommending the 2% COLA for full time. Uh, the budgetary impact when you include the step increase is about 3%. Again, a 20 cent an hour for part-time seasonal. Uh, we've got some rate relief with CERS. Um, employee take-home pay will be impacted by the change in the tax calculation on CERS as well as our change in premiums and uh, the copay. And again, our full-time complement will still be lower than it was in 2009. So any questions on the personnel side? Your questions. Thank you, Mr. Grubbs. Appreciate right. it. I will move into the capital budget then. Uh, the CIP is our annual plan where we determine uh, and indicate what we're going to spend on public facilities, on our infrastructure, on equipment. Uh, pretty much projects that are $25,000 or greater are included in the CIP, or if we have several pieces of small equipment that are grouped that are like, uh, we list those in the CIP. Uh, this chart goes back uh, 10 or 11 years and shows uh, kind of an overall comparison of where we've been. 2007 being our, our great year when we had a capital budget of $33 million, debt of less than $9 million, and debt was just slightly over a quarter of the CIP. Then you hit our bad year of 2010 when our capital budget was half of what it was three years earlier. Uh, we had no money in the general fund budget that year for capital, and debt was 80% of the budget. So basically we had no CIP that year. Uh, but then you'll see as the years have gone by, uh, we have slowly I've been able to increase the size of the CIP. The general fund piece of that has gone up. Uh, debt has started to drop, and now debt is less than half of the CIP, uh, which is obviously uh, great news for us. And as previously mentioned by Aaron, uh, the CIP this coming year, while it's a total of about 27 million, 15 million of that is actual capital, uh, actual capital projects. In the budget book, uh, you all have a description of each of the projects uh, that will be listed, so I'm not necessarily going to mention every single one. Uh, but what we do is, is go through and identify the capital projects compared to the strategic goal, uh, strategic goal plans that the Board of Commissioners has set out. So this chart shows that 48% of the projects uh, for this coming year are in the category we call community livability. And just as comparison, this, this year we're ending that piece of the pie was 25%, so the community livability section has really uh, increased. Facilities and equipment uh, this coming year will be 23%, but 
this year we're ending was 34%. So again, that shows we're putting much more into uh, the community type projects. And even though we've expanded the budget for our facilities and equipment, as far as the piece of the pies, that will actually be a little bit less uh, this coming year. Uh, community livability uh, for next year, total budget of $7.2 million. This year it was 2.1 million. So immediately uh, anyone can see that the city is going to be putting a lot more money into projects uh, that are gonna benefit our citizens. Already mentioned are, are the sidewalk, uh, the money for sidewalks, uh, stormwater mitigation, a half a million dollars again. And the city has put in almost $4 million into this since the May 2010 flood. Uh, Parks and Recreation, $5.6 million. Uh, in the budget this year, this category was $300,000. So Parks is going to see a many time increase um, for projects this coming year thanks to the work that the city has done with the master plan. Um, that includes the Preston Miller Soccer Complex, three fields and a restroom. Already mentioned is the work already underway, uh, planning for Lover's Lane. Uh, we're proposing a spray park at Lampkin Park, uh, improvements at Fountain Square Park, uh, Shelter 2 replacement at Covington Woods, and also replacing playgrounds at Cariacas and, and Pedigo, uh, both of uh, which would get larger playgrounds and have two separate playgrounds for, for age-appropriate uh, play. Uh, previously mentioned earlier uh, during the regular commission meeting was the Bowling Green Reinvestment Area Neighborhood Improvement Program. <laughs> Uh, you all approved uh, sidewalk work. Um, this program has been proposed for the last couple of years and the city had already been setting aside money uh, for work on the west side of town. Uh, the first target area is between Chestnut, the bypass Fairview and 14th. And you can see there are the other types of projects that are proposed by neighborhood community services. Street resurfacing, again, the city has increased uh, the funds that will go toward this. Uh, program and we expect to be able to do about 12 miles of roadway depending on conditions. Small House Road, a uh, project we've been preparing for the last couple of years. Uh, 1.1 million in the budget this year, but the total projects, uh, the two phases is $5.5 .5 million that we'll be funding over multiple years trying to widen the road between Campbell Lane, first to Highland Way and then to Ridgecrest, Ridgecrest and beyond and also putting in a signal at Cave Mill Road and the crossings. Moving to technology improvements over $1.1 million. Um, 400,000 would be in uh, information technology, obviously different types of software for various departments, as well as equipment replacement and upgrades. Other public safety, um, over $700,000. Uh, previously discussed Previously discussed the body-worn cameras, which was presented to you separately by the police department. Of course, the bulk of that cost is actually for servers and technology and data, um, main, main, uh, data software and editing. Another uh, project we're proposing is a simulator for police firearms, and that's actually to be funded out of our property and casualty fund um, because we know that this will help reduce any possibility of any liability claims. Uh, by preparing police officers to have equipment available all the time where they can simulate the use of firearms and uh, also have the opportunity for two officers to use it at the same time. We can use it for remedial training for new recruits, um, so a lot of opportunity there. A replacement of equipment such as tasers and rifles, an alarm notification system replacement in our fire stations, and as previously mentioned, continuing the park surveillance cameras uh, this, this coming year, they would be at Lover's Lane Soccer Complex and Cariacas. Um, vehicle and equipment replacement. Uh, not sexy, but something we need to do. And we're proposing almost $2 million in this coming year budget for a variety of equipment replacement. And that's up from $1.2 million this year that we're completing. Uh, $1.2 million for facility improvements. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, Sloan Convention Center, which has a separate uh, enterprise fund, uh, over $800,000 for the roof, parking lot landscaping, and automatic doors. Uh, doing work here at City Hall, replacing windows, doing painting, tuck pointing, and brick repair. Uh, the locker room and the fitness room at the police station has not been touched since the building opened. So we're going to do renovation there and then part of the parking lot at the police station 
would be milled and repaped and restriped. Then we have some money for other equipment, such as lobby furniture in the convention center, replacing one of the air conditioning units of police and the generator for the city hall annex. And this uh, chart, again, kind of shows an overall history with the capital budget. You can see generally the debt, which is the middle section, has sort of remained flat if you compare 2008 to now. Uh, the general fund, uh, which pays for the projects, you know, dipped to zero, and now we're working our way up. And then you've got the total CIP as, CIP as the dark uh, number at the top. And again, uh, debt was 80% of the capital budget in 2010, and it will be 44% in this coming budget. In review, uh, this is the largest capital budget since 2007. As already said, we're using no fund balance. There's no new debt. 36% um, of what debt we have is being reimbursed by others. Uh, $5 million is the ballpark. Uh, I mean, there's a $5.1 million general fund debt, which includes ballpark and ITA. Um, equipment replacement, again, I mentioned, uh, mentioned it. And this is a really uh, interesting slide for us. And during the dark years, uh, three-year period, we only spent a quarter of a million dollars on all equipment replacement. For public works and parks, uh, for a six-year period, was a half a million dollars. The last two years was 1.1 million, and this year we're proposing 1.3. So a definite uh, change in our budget now that we're able to do some equipment replacement. And I'm sure Parks and Public Works will be very appreciative of you approving the budget for next year. Uh, just overall, final, uh, we're continuing the prior priority community impact goals uh, that have been established and also projects that were started in earlier years. Uh, we're increasing the use of our lo local tax revenues for projects such as street paving, sidewalks, and small house road. Uh, this allows us to replace equipment to improve our facilities and also enhance our technology. And we're continuing to set aside funds as we can for our future needs so that we don't have to take out debt. Any questions on the CIP? Okay, I'm going to turn it back to Katie, who will talk about agency appropriation. We're almost done. We're nearing the conclusion. Okay. Agency funding for next year, we're proposing a 2% increase over the FY16 budget, almost $1.3 million. And you can see over time, over the last several years, we've actually reduced agency funding uh, from over 1.6 million down to about 1.3 million uh, this year. This particular chart identifies what we are recommending for each of the agencies. It also identifies what the agencies had requested. We, uh, the requested amount from the agencies totaled about $83,500 more than the adopted budget in 16, and we are recommending to provide about 30% of an increase of that amount. The recommended amounts are identified, as I mentioned. Uh, those agencies, most agencies that had, received, that had requested an increase will get up to a 3% increase, and there are two agencies. Uh, the Drug Task Force is recommended to receive the amount requested to help offset a loss in federal grant funds, and Operation Pride is recommended to receive the balance remaining for taking over the old Louisville Road mowing project. In past years, you'll note um, the Welfare Center has been fortunate to receive some additional funding from the city through excess gas franchise fees that we've collected over $200,000. We had a municipal order back in 2008 that directed this to take place. We continue it when we can. However, this upcoming and current fiscal year, we don't anticipate there to be any additional money to be uh, provided through that since we are not projecting to even reach $200,000 in collection for gas franchise this year. There are a couple other items that do impact our agency funding and go along with it. Uh, one of those is the dollar for dollar match that we provide of the employee pledges for United Way. The city matches what the employees have pledged, and that money is to be spent. Our only restriction on it is that it should be spent in Warren County. Otherwise, we don't restrict how the United Way chooses to spend that. How do we know? Pardon me? How do we know that that amount is spent in Warren County? I'm supposed to receive a, each year um, a report back 
from United Way and they let us know how they've spent that money. And then we've also set aside $10,000 uh, for emergency management services to continue the expansion of the outdoor warning siren uh, system in the city limits. At one siren, is that the cost of one siren? We tried to, uh, we wanted to make them digital, you know, high tech. So we've been doing one a year to make sure the whole community is uh, up, uh, is, you know, advanced at a higher level of technology. Airport grant matches, what are we matching there? Was it in there? Uh, yeah, we, we have currently $43,000 of unspent money that we have um, appropriated in previous budget years and just continued to carry forward. Um, and so we haven't spent it yet. We're proposing not to add any additional money to that, um, but to continue to have that $43,000 available for next year uh, and spend it. What they, we have, the airport presents to us when they get an FAA grant and the city has a match requirement for that, uh, we approve those by municipal order at the board level, um, but we don't pay out until they actually have finished in that grant and they need to receive that reimbursement, so then they request it later. Uh, so you may see where we've approved some grants in the past year, but we haven't actually paid out. Um, we did pay out a couple, though, this year. We had over 50000 in the budget initially. Uh, we did pay out a couple this year that we had requested, that they had requested payment for. Um, but again, we don't propose adding any additional money to that. We'll just continue to carry that 43000 over. And the agency funding represents 2% of the general fund expenditures, which is about where it's been uh, over the last several years. At this point, uh, the budget team would like to thank Laura Harris for helping us with the graphics this year for our uh, budget document and this presentation. And then also Sean Weeks, uh, who deserves some special recognition for his participation in the revenue budgeting process. So at this time, we've concluded our presentation. Do you have any additional questions or anything that you would like us to respond to? Comments or questions? Yes, ma'am. But, um, two questions regarding the agency funding, please. Mm -hmm. I believe it's been a budget, at least maybe two budgets ago, we had 80000 set aside mm -hmm. for BG Transit. Yes. Is that, that 80000 still here? Yes, yes that so. 80000 is still available. It has gone unspent. We will continue to carry that money forward, uh, appropriated for that purpose until a decision has been made on how that needs to be spent. Okay, good. And um, there's been talk um, for funding 211 from United Way. What do we need to do about that? The board just needs to decide if you want to do that, how much that needs to be, and then we can uh, have a municipal order approved by the board to, to appropriate it. Okay. We will present the final uh, agency funding recommendations at the second meeting in June, so that at that point you can decide how much you want specifically to go to each of these agencies. This is just the initial proposal. Um, if you would like additional money added for United Way, uh, that isn't currently, I don't believe, included in that municipal order, but we could uh, add that money. We would just take it from the contingency balance, so we would not, again, impact fund balance in any way. Uh, we would just work within the money we already have allotted. The second meeting in June. So we, we'll present the budget ordinance essentially with the 1.27 million in for agencies um, for first reading at the fir first meeting in June, on June 7th. And then at the second meeting, when we have the second reading of that budget, we would also have a municipal order uh, to provide the actual appropriations for the agencies. And again, we can change that amount at any point. We just, at the, we just include the 1.2 million in the, the budget and we can take any additional funding that you'd like to direct toward there out of another source. Is it better to have those changes before our first June meeting? Is that easier on you? If there's agreement by the board, absolutely. Okay. We, if you want to come to a consensus right now, we can go okay. ahead and adjust that within the budget ordinance before. Or we, we would it. discuss it at that meeting. Yes. Either, or, okay. either way. Thank you. Okay. I'd just like to. First of all, thank the budget team for their hard work and this, uh, the good background information that we've all received. And
quite honestly, it's one of the best best budget presentations I've ever seen. Thank and you. I've seen a lot of budgets. We appreciate so, that. Thank, thank you. you very much. If there's no other questions. Any other comments or questions? At this point. Other than to echo that. Great job. Okay, great job. The information here that you we read before we came in, and I know you're summarizing it mainly for, for the public, but it's a wonderful document to help people understand where, what we're doing with their money that we take from them in taxes. At risk of bragging, we, we do get an award for that, right, don't we, every yes. year? <laughs> I guess we just bragged, so. I, yeah. We do. You I did deserve a great job. to brag. Great job. I'd like to, I'd like to defer compliments to Katie and Aaron for that book because they do the bulk of the work on it so I, I can't take any credit much for it I'll refer to it all year long it's great uh, great document thanks Thank you. when we do have the budget finally adopted and proposed I do put that out on the website so that anyone can pull it up and look at it we have documents that I believe go back to 2006 of the budget already out there we'll also have a hard copy available in the lobby downstairs for anyone to come in and look at um, we can certainly provide copies to anyone who would like to request those. We would charge 10 cents a page, though, if we did copies. But when we posted it on the budget, uh, on the website, then it's free to whoever wants to look at it and download it. You post the entire thing? We do. Both, both no, notebooks? No, uh, the summary document, uh, so the smaller notebook, is what we post. Um, that gives the majority of the information. We don't do the line item reporting. That gets a little bit cumbersome and tedious, but if anyone has questions about it or would like more information, we would be glad to provide it. Any other comments or questions? That's the last item on our agenda. We'll be going in closed session, so if uh, we'll give you just a few minutes to take a restroom break, and there'll be no vote coming out. No vote coming out. Thank you for tuning in.